The year is 2008. You just got out of school and went on a trip to GameStop for your birthday. You get to choose any game you want. You already have Super Mario Galaxy, Super Paper Mario, Twilight Princess, and most of the big Wii games that are already out. From the corner of your eye, you see a cover with an interesting looking creature, which you later learn is a bullborb, trying to attack these small bipedal fellows, which you would learn are the namesake of the game itself, Pikmin. Curious as to what it is, you decide why not give it a try, as it is a Nintendo game after all. You get home, insert the disc, and get immersed in this real-time strategy adventure with Captain Olimar as you explore PNF 404 with the Pikmin you recruit along the way. Hi, I'm LP from Game Domain, and welcome to A Journey Through the Gardens, a Pikmin documentary. Join me as we start from the humble beginnings of the Pikmin franchise all the way up to where we are now with the incoming release of Pikmin 4. The story begins in Nintendo Space World 2000. At this event, Super Mario 128 is presented to the public as a tech demo meant to showcase the power of Nintendo's upcoming home console at the time, the Nintendo GameCube. This particular tech demo inspired many features such as the spear walking scene in Mario Galaxy or the physics in Metroid Prime. However, for Pikmin, it was the idea of having a large number of characters on screen acting independently of each other. Shigeru Miyamoto would take this concept and try to apply it to a full-scale game. During the Game Developers Conference of 2007, Miyamoto, alongside director Shigafumi Hino, explained that the original concept of Pikmin was a game about two people, Adam and Eve. The idea was to have the player observe Adam and Eve as they live their lives in a prehistoric world. Acting as a sort of god, the player could make them create a family, or make them fight. If Adam and Eve created a family, the player could use their many offspring to fight against prehistoric animals like mammoths. The feature of grabbing these little offsprings and throwing them was added in to make the game a little bit more interactable. Due to their vision of animating and controlling hundreds of these creatures, the designs of Adam and Eve were simplified into the form of Pikmin that we see today. The team also decided to add the player into the game even though they were at first meant to be just an observer. Despite all of this, the team's vision for the game wasn't yet super clear. It was only after seeing the Pikmin in action that things seemed to click. Hino explains, I can still clearly recall the first time that I saw multiple Pikmin working together to carry a big opponent. Until then, we had been struggling to find the direction that this game should have, but when these carry actions were completed, we were able to determine the future of Pikmin. Pikmin was first unveiled to the public at E3 2001 with a trailer showcasing the unique, bizarre, but charming world of Pikmin. Being the first RTS or real-time strategy game developed by Nintendo, many in the audience weren't quite sure what they were looking at. Thankfully, a short demo of the game was played live in front of the public explaining the basic concept of the game, the controls, and the gameplay. A few months later, on October 26th, Pikmin would release on the Nintendo GameCube in Japan, followed by a North American release on December 2nd, and a European one on June 14th, 2002. The main premise of Pikmin is that the protagonist, Captain Olimar, crash-landed on a mysterious planet. Due to said crash, his spaceship is in ruins, with 30 of its pieces missing. With the help of the Pikmin, the weird ant-like species living on the planet, Olimar has to find all 30 missing pieces of his ship all in 30 days. The Pikmin come in three colors, and each one has a special ability. The red ones are resistant to fire, and they are the strongest ones in combat. The yellow ones can carry bomb rocks and be thrown higher than the other Pikmin. Finally, the blue ones are the only ones capable of swimming. It's so much so that if a non-blue Pikmin enters a body of water, blue Pikmin immediately come to their rescue. Each type of Pikmin has an associated onion that serves as a sort of nest. If a Pikmin brings a pellet or enemy carcass to its respective onion, a new Pikmin will be born. Each day is about 13 minutes in real time, and at the end of each, Olimar has to take all of his Pikmin, he can have up to 100 of them at any one time, and go back to the base camp to avoid the nightly predators. Every Pikmin that does not make it to the base camp is eaten. Most of the game is spent utilizing the various Pikmin's ability in order to solve puzzles, carry items, 
and fight enemies all across the game's five areas. Finding more ship parts repairs the ship, which then in turn unlocks new areas. After Olmar unlocks all three Pikmin types, Challenge Mode becomes available. The mode's objective is to grow as many Pikmin as possible in one single day. The game contains three endings. The best ending is achieved by finding all 30 ship pieces before the 30-day limit. The normal ending is achieved by finding 25, and any lower than that gives the bad ending, causing the life support system of the ship to fail and leading to Olmar's death. Pikmin was really well received critically. Sites like IGN all agreed that Pikmin had impressive graphics for the time. But more than anything, it was praised for how unique it was. The environment and gameplay of Pikmin were both seen as innovative and a breath of fresh air for the industry. Some criticized the control of the camera and some found the game a tad too short, but for a new IP, Pikmin did really well with the critics. Sales-wise, Pikmin had a strong first week, selling more than 100,000 copies, but those sales figures quickly fell to around 10 to 15,000 the following weeks. Funnily enough, on December 6, 2001, a single used in the Japanese commercials for the game, titled Ai no Uta by the group Strawberry Flower, released. The single had helped raise sales to around 22,000 copies in a week. But to the surprise of all, Ai no Uta became a sensational hit, with its own sales even surpassing the sales of the game itself. The momentum created by Eino Uta's success led to Pikmin selling 53,000 copies in the week of December 26th and 102,000 copies in the week of January 6th. To this day, the original Pikmin has sold over 1.19 million copies worldwide. Not too shabby. Of course, after seeing the resounding success of the first game, Nintendo and Miyamoto quickly got to work on a sequel. We first heard about said sequel in December of 2002, during an interview with Japan's weekly Playboy magazine. Yeah, you heard that right. In said interview, Miyamoto commented that Pikmin 2 and the Mario 128 game that was shown at the GameCube unveiling are both in development. As a side note, Mario 128 was never properly released. In a 2007 interview, Miyamoto stated the following. The one question I'm always asked is, what happened to Mario 128? Well, most of you already played it, in a game called the Pikmin. Anyway, development for this Pikmin sequel took about two and a half years. It was originally meant to release in autumn 2003, but the game had to be delayed for another six months in order to apply further changes and revisions. The same team returned for the sequel, and they had a couple of new ideas for this next entry. First, they removed the 30-day limit. Now, this was done to allow players to play at a more leisurely pace, and subsequently made the game longer, a common criticism of the first entry. Next, they wanted to add a co-op option inside of the single-player mode, uh, but the team found that adding co-op would require them to change the game's single-player design too much, and thus decided to relegate it to its own game mode. Pikmin 2 would show its face during E3 2003 with various demos and trailers showcasing some of the game's new features, challenge mode, and various. Eventually, Pikmin 2 would release on April 29, 2004 in Japan, August 30th in North America, and October 8th in Europe for the Nintendo GameCube. The story in this sequel is that the company Olimar works for is in massive debt. But it turns out that a bottle cap that Olimar had brought back from the Pikmin planet is actually quite valuable. As such, the president, Olimar's employer, orders him and a clumsy new employee named Wooey to return to the Pikmin planet and search for treasures to help pay off the debt. The game plays very much like Pikmin 1. Same limit of 100 Pikmin, same mechanics of throwing and directing the Pikmin, same inability to play during night, but the removal of the 30-day limit allowing players to fully explore the planet. When it comes to the Pikmin, only the yellow ones have actually been changed. They are no longer the only ones to carry bomb rocks, but are now instead immune to electrical hazards. However, three new type of Pikmin are also introduced. Purple Pikmin are underground Pikmin that can carry the spherical atlas. Due to their weight, Purple Pikmin can shake the ground when thrown, causing nearby enemies to be stunned. They replace Reds as the strongest type of Pikmin. White Pikmin are also found underground and have the special ability of being immune to poison. They can also find a buried treasure, all on their own. They're the fastest type of Pikmin too, and whenever they get eaten by bosses, they poison them, chipping away at their health. 
In the case of normal enemies, they just outright kill them. And finally, we have the Bulbmen. They are a parasitic species that infects the Bulbul, the most common enemies in the series. Bulbmen are immune to all hazards, but can only be found and used in caves. Purple and white Pikmin do not have onions and can only reproduce by being thrown at rare candy pop bud flowers. Pikmin 2 also introduces two sprays. The purple spray petrifies enemies, rendering them vulnerable to attacks, while the red spray boosts the attack and speed of the affected Pikmin. Now, the game is separated into four zones, and the game ends after retrieving all 201 treasures. Funnily enough, uh, some of these treasures are actually product placements with the player being able to scavenge the Duracell battery, a 7-up bottle cap, or a jar of Skippy peanut butter. As I said before, the development team wanted to add a co-op option for the story mode, but instead opted to make co-op its own mode. In it, the two players are assigned either red or blue Pikmin, marble that matches the color of their Pikmin and an onion. There are four ways to win. One is to take four yellow marbles to the player's respective onion. The second is to take your opponent's marble and bring it to your onion. The third is for your opponent to suffer a Pikmin extermination, meaning that all of their Pikmin die. And the last one is by downing the enemy leader. These battles are set in 10 different underground levels that vary in difficulty. Pikmin 2 was another critical success. For many reviewers, Pikmin 2 improved on its predecessor in pretty much every way. The removal of the 30-day limit was praised for increasing the game's longevity. The game's graphics, animations, and environments were all seen as a major step up from the first game. Again, some complained about some camera issues, or Pikmin getting stuck, or Pikmin breaking from the group, but in general, Pikmin 2 is considered one of the best games to have been released on the Nintendo GameCube. In total, Pikmin 2 sold over 1.12 million copies. That now makes back-to-back -back hits for the Pikmin series. With both installments doing so well financially as well as critically, you would expect a third to come out not too long after, right? Well, and with Pikmin 2 releasing in 2004, all eyes were set towards Nintendo's next console, the Wii, to be the all of the next entry in the Pikmin series. And that entry would come in the form of... New Play Control! Pikmin, a... enhanced port of the first game? Yes. New Play Control were a series of Nintendo GameCube games which got ported to the Wii with enhanced graphics, widescreen support, and most importantly, a modified control scheme to fit the Wii Remote and Nunchuck. The initiative was revealed in October 2008 with Donkey Kong Jungle Beat and, of course, Pikmin 1 set to release later that year. And so, New Play Control Pikmin released on Christmas 2008 in Japan and in February 2009 in the West. Finally, Wii owners could play the original Pikmin, even though they already could because the Wii was backwards compatible with the GameCube. Finally, Wii owners could play the original Pikmin. Even though they already could, because the Wii was backwards compatible with the GameCube. Uh, jokes aside, this port of the original game came with previously mentioned enhancements of the New Play Control series, but it also came with a day-to-day -day save feature that allowed players to go back to one of the 30 days if they felt that they should have done something differently. Pikmin 2 would also receive a New Play Control version, but only in Japan and Europe in 2009. North America would have to wait until 2012 for this version of Pikmin 2 to come out, at least it came under the Nintendo Select series, a series of re-releases that retailed at a lower price from $49.99 to $19.99. And while it's not a new game, it wouldn't do to not mention another big thing that happened for the Pikmin franchise. I'm of course talking about Olimar's addition to Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Our small astronaut was confirmed as a playable character on January 9th, 2008 to the official Dojo site. As is the case in his games, Olimar relies on his Pikmin's various abilities to get an edge in combat. Like for many lesser-known franchises, Olimar's addition in Smash was a pretty big deal for the fanbase. It was a chance to present the Pikmin series to an even larger audience. I wouldn't be surprised if many people had never even heard of Pikmin before they saw Olimar in Smash. Not only that, especially since Brawl being part of the Smash roster is a way of solidifying your place as an important player in the history of video games. I mean, seeing little Olimar fighting alongside the lights of Mario, Donkey Kong, Pikachu, Sonic? It was quite an honor. So, for the DS and Wii era, Pikmin didn't get a single new entry. Yes, Olimar got into Smash, but it was still kind of underwhelming as it meant that the franchise hadn't had a new game in almost a decade. However, pretty much every fan of the series knew 
that a new game was coming. Why? Well, because the new Pikmin game had been confirmed to be in development all the way back in 2008. Before 2008, there wasn't much support for the existence of a third Pikmin other than fans thinking it was the obvious thing to do considering the success of the first two entries. However, in a 2007 interview with IGN, Miyamoto hinted at the possibility of a new game, saying, I certainly don't think we've seen the last of Pikmin. I definitely would like to do something with them, and I think the Wii interface in particular is very well suited to that franchise. A 2008 article from CNET stated that while Miyamoto wanted to continue the series, he instead wanted to focus on other Wii projects. Thankfully, proper confirmation arrived during E3 of that year where Miyamoto announced that he and the team were working on a third game without specifying any more details. Information on Pikmin 3 would lay dormant for another three years before Miyamoto announced the development of Pikmin 3 had moved to Nintendo's next console, the Wii U at E3. 2011, stating then that the console's HD graphics and gamepad would be better suited for it. Fans of the series would have to wait until June 5, 2012 before seeing the very first footage of Pikmin 3 during Nintendo's presentation at E3. The trailer showed the new protagonist, the new Rock Pikmin, and the gameplay controls. A Nintendo Direct in December showcased two new modes, Mission Mode and bingo mode alongside the purple and white Pikmin who had yet to be seen by that point, but were also exclusive to those modes. Animated shorts were meant to go live before the game's release, but would get delayed until 2014, well after the game had already been out on shelves. The original plan was for Pikmin 3 to release close to the Wii U's launch, but the game would get delayed until mid-2013 when it was released in July in Japan and Europe and in August in North America. The Pikmin 3's plot is pretty simple. The inhabitants of planet Kopai are suffering from a famine due to overpopulation when searching for a planet with an abundant amount of food they find PNF-404, the Pikmin planet of the first two games. Three captains, Alf, Brittany, and Charlie make their way up to retrieve food for their home planet. The core gameplay has not changed much, not much point changing a winning strategy, right? The three classic Pikmin are still there, but two new types are also introduced. Rock Pikmin are immune to stabbing and crushing attacks, they deal a lot of damage when thrown, and are used to destroy crystalline objects. Winged Pikmin, as their name suggests, can fly over hazards and bodies of water. Their ability to fly allows them to take shortcuts when carrying items, avoiding the walls and water that might get in the way. The player can control all three captains and switch between them instantly. The gamepad serves mostly as a map to help the player navigate around the game's five areas. The player can also move a captain just by tracing their path on the map. In the previously mentioned bingo battle mode, each participant has a 4x4 grid of items to collect. The first one to get a four in a row on their board wins. The other, mission mode, can be done solo or in co-op and consists of completing a task in a limited amount of time. This can either be collecting treasure, beating a wave of enemies, or beating bosses. Pikmin 3 was another well-received game. Much of the praise came from the environment and graphics, something the series was already well known for at this point, and the level design. Most reviewers gave the game an 8 out of 10, the only major complaint being that some thought that the game was, again, too short, specifically as compared to Pikmin 2. Sales-wise, the game did pretty well considering the Wii U's lack of success with about 210,000 units sold by the end of December in the US. Remember those animated shorts I talked about earlier that released like a year after Pikmin 3? Well, during a Q&A following their releases in 2014, Miyamoto stated that those shorts were meant to lay the groundwork for the next iteration of Pikmin. The following year, he would confirm that he still had many more ideas that he wanted to try with Pikmin, and that while nothing was decided yet, he still wanted to work on the series. In September, he would even confirm that not only was a new Pikmin game in development, it was almost finished. Fans couldn't wait to see what kind of game Pikmin 4 would end up being, and their patience would be rewarded during the Direct of September 2016 in which they saw a 2.5D Pikmin game for the, for the 3DS. Uh, now, that didn't necessarily mean the game was going to be bad, but to go from Pikmin 3's HD graphics on the Wii U to the 3DS's 240p resolution had to be quite the shock for Pikmin fans. The game's name, Hey Pikmin, 
It would be confirmed the following year during April 2017's Direct with a release planned for July 28th. A major thing to know about Hey Pikmin is that it was not developed by Nintendo, but instead by a studio named Azrest who had previously worked on We Play Motion, Street Pass's Mi Plaza, and Yoshi's New Island. Shigafumi Hino, the director of the series, was also not involved in the project, going by the credits. The game is not a real-time strategy game anymore, and plays instead like a 2D platformer. The player controls Olimar on a mysterious planet in search of Sparklium to fuel his ship. While Olimar can swim and use a jetpack, he cannot attack, having to rely on the Pikmin for that and for help in clearing puzzles to advance to the next level. The more Sparklium that Olimar collects, the more fuel his jetpack has and the more durable he is as well. After every level, Pikmin go inside what is called a Pikmin Park where they can find Sparklium. If they find colored pellets, the amount of Pikmin in the park can be increased. The reception to Hey Pikmin was... mixed. It's not a terrible game. But it really wasn't that formidable, even if you try to look at it for what it is and not compare it to the other entries in the series. Many found the puzzles to be very simple, just a question of throwing Pikmin's at the problem. The game just wasn't all that exciting. A relatively boring platformer. I guess the silver lining is that if you were a Pikmin fan was that, hey, Pikmin was not the game Miyamoto was talking about. After all, in June 2017, he assured Eurogamer that development was still progressing, stating that it's actually very close to completion, which is what he had already told Eurogamer two years prior. In both of the interviews, the subject was actually about the development of the next Pikmin game, and Miyamoto didn't seem to indicate that, hey, Pikmin was the game he was talking about back in 2015. Add on top of that that Nintendo were not the developers of Hey Pikmin, and we get good evidence that Miyamoto has been talking about Pikmin 4, an actual new entry in the main series, since 2014 to 2015. But on a side note, considering that it's been six years since Miyamoto made this statement and Pikmin 4 is only now getting a release date, I think Miyamoto might have a different definition of very close to completion than us. Anyways, other than that statement, Pikmin fans had nothing to get excited about. It would only be in 2020 that a remastered port of Pikmin 3 would come out on the Nintendo Switch. This version of the game came with a new prologue and epilogue, multiple difficulty modes, co-op in the story mode, the Pikipedia from Pikmin 2, and all the DLCs from the Wii U release. A nice port that enhances on the original game. But Pikmin 4, it is not. But then, finally, during the Nintendo Direct on September 13th, 2022, the world would get its first look at the long-awaited Pikmin 4. A game that had been teased since 2015 was finally getting shown to the public. Of course, it was only a teaser of the environment and nothing more, but considering how long fans had to wait, it was more than enough to know that the project was still a thing. Then, in February of this year, a new Direct aired which showed extended gameplay of the game itself showing a new dog companion called Oachi, the return of purple and white Pikmin, the introduction of an ice Pikmin, and the new protagonist, Palm. But most importantly, perhaps, this trailer revealed that the game was set to release on July 21st of this year, a day that Pikmin fans all over the world, like myself, have circled on our calendars. Whew, that was quite the journey, wasn't it? Well, despite being over 20 years old, the Pikmin franchise doesn't quite feel that old, does it? I mean, it's only now getting its fourth main series game, yet all of the games in the series, except for, hey, Pikmin, have been incredibly successful. The visual identity of this franchise, alongside its tight game design and its unique gameplay, has made it a very solid member of Nintendo's big catalog and one of my personal favorites. We can only hope that this fourth entry lives up to our expectations. I hope that you enjoyed this video. This was LP at Game Domain. Be sure to subscribe, like, comment below what documentaries you'd like us to make in the future, and turn on notifications so that you're alerted on them. This has been a journey through the gardens, a Pikmin documentary.